still about ten. Alright, <laughs> so, I think we'll get started, inshallah. Um, first, we'll start, inshallah, with the Surah Al Fatiha. I would be laying in a shaitan regime, Summa Rahman Rahim. I would be laying in a shaitan regime, Bismillah, Hill Rahman, Hill Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Hill Rabbin Alameen, or Rahman, Hill Rahim, Maliki, O Middin. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين Without further ado, inshallah, uh, I'll let uh, Imam Ugra start the talk straight away, I'm sure. He uh, doesn't need any uh, introduction, I'm sure most of you have sort of heard his talks on Friday, so I'll let him get started straight away, inshallah. Women and Islam, not women in Islam. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa ahda wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'da wa ba'da. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, to participate in the De Montfort University's Islamic Society's Islam Awareness Week. And uh, I was very pleased to hear the title that was suggested, Women and Islam. And uh, happy to know that it's not women in Islam, but rather women and Islam. And I've had the opportunity to come across literature and various talks where the issue is more about women in Islam and I think it's probably a response to the criticism that the Muslim community faces with regards to the treatment of women within Muslim uh, life or within Muslim society hence we find always uh, the issue being addressed as women in Islam but I'd like to approach this topic from the angle of uh, women and Islam, not necessarily women following the Muslim tradition, but all women in general, uh, and how they are looked at uh, by Islam and what their position is in light of the teachings of Islam and Muslim tradition. And I feel that uh, the best way to start this would be to give you all an idea of the climate in which Islam came with the different requirements of the treatment of women and the position of women in society generally. And of course we'd have to go back to the time of the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and salutations be upon him to try and gauge and get an idea of what the position of a woman was in society during his lifetime. As you are aware he was part of the society in the Arabian Peninsula in Makkah. Uh, you could extend that to the Hijaz perhaps and I think this is true of the entire of the Arabian Peninsula in those days and perhaps even beyond the boundaries of the peninsula to other parts of that area where the Arab people lived. In their society, before Islam was introduced to their society, they had a, a distinct idea of the position of women within their society. It was, not, it was certainly not a view that women are an equal part of society but rather their view was that women are the most inferior part of society. Perhaps they would 
list them down among or along a list of their belongings. If one were to sit down to list down what property they own, their women would be on that list alongside their camels and their goats and their sheep. This was the attitude that the Arab society, that Arabian society had towards women. And women were regarded as unclean and impure, especially during the days of the month when they were menstruating. And of course, women who had the misfortune of being divorced or widowed were also frowned upon. They were not looked uh, upon favorably. So the general trend and the attitudes of people in that society was that to be associated with a woman or to have a family in which a daughter is born was the worst thing that could happen to any family. On the one hand, where the birth of a son was welcomed and celebrated and rejoiced. On the other hand, the birth of a daughter was regarded as extreme bad luck. Something that many would not wish for their enemy also to be blessed with a daughter. And this is what the Quran makes reference to. وَإِذَا الْمَوْءُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ When the infant, the girl, on the day of judgment will be questioned by God, by Allah, that why were you buried alive in the ground? What sin did you commit? What crime did you commit to deserve such treatment from your father? So the practice in that society was that if a daughter was born, the family regarded that as something to be shameful of and the father would, in the middle of the night, take that baby, his own baby daughter, his own flesh and blood, into the desert, dig a hole in the sand and bury her alive. And this is recorded in the Qur'an, so as Muslims we have full faith and full confidence in the report of such activities. So it is in an environment of these attitudes that the Messenger Muhammad, peace be on him, had to educate and convince people that the woman had a very special role to play in society. He had to educate and convince people that the woman was an equal partner in life. He had to educate and convince people that the life of a daughter was as valuable and precious as that of a son. He had to educate and convince people that the birth of a daughter deserved as much celebration and rejoicing as the birth of a son. That is the scenario that faced him and that is the environment in which he had to pass his message of kindness and the status of women in, the, in this new tradition that he was sent with, this way of life that he was given by God Almighty to share with the Arabian people and indeed with the people of the world. And so we try to trace back the steps that he took in that long process, a very lengthy process of educating his society and his community. It certainly wasn't very easy. Remembering that the main difficulty that he had was the opposition that he faced in proclaiming that there is only one God. That in itself created huge problems 
for his community because they were not prepared to accept that there can only be one worthy of worship. They were used to worshipping hundreds of idols, hundreds of different gods. So this idea that there is only one God was alien to their society. And alongside that, the messenger had to teach and preach the position of women in relation to Islam. What the teachings of Islam were about the position of women in society. So he had a very difficult task ahead of him. And we believe as Muslims that Allah guided him all the way and gave him the wisdom with which he was able to accomplish even the most difficult of tasks. And I'm always filled with inspiration and overall when I look at the methodology adopted by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger Muhammad peace be on him in his endeavor to educate his people about the status and the position of women in his new message that he had brought with him. And we see that he started from the very bottom, so to speak, of the ladder, the last rung of the ladder. He started working from, you might call the grassroots level. And he concentrated on the family structure. Because that is where the root of the problem lay. From the birth of the daughter, which led to this mentality of the daughter or the female being something unwanted, which then took hold in the whole of society. So he concentrated on that first level, the first step. And so we find in his sermons, uh, in his teachings, whenever he spoke about social issues, family issues, there was a time when he stood up to deliver his message. And in his message he said, I guarantee paradise, Jannah, heaven. For whoever succeeds in raising four daughters to be good citizens, to be decent people, to be decent and caring human beings, if any one of you can do that, then I guarantee you Jannah. We have a variety of or different uh, narrations with regard to this. But the meaning of all is very encouraging and it certainly was very encouraging for the people who were being addressed at that particular time because the Muslims who had begun to treat women with respect as equal partners and fellow human beings rather than property were facing criticism from the non-Muslim society that they lived side by side with and we find that during that gathering, one person stood up and said, Messenger of Allah, what if somebody has only three daughters and not four? Only three daughters. And the Messenger, peace be on him, said, three daughters. If you can raise up three daughters to be decent human beings, then I guarantee you entry into heaven. And the tradition goes to say somebody stood up and said, what about two daughters? And somebody said, what about one daughter? The emphasis was that if you treat your daughters with respect, with love and kindness, you raise them up to be decent human beings, good citizens, caring people, then you shall have entry into paradise and I guarantee that. This is one wonderful way in which I believe the messenger set out to put this very fundamental wrong right in society. That was a fundamental uh, problem within society with regard to the treatment of women. And he felt that if society were to be cured from the rest of its ills, one had to start from these very fundamental issues to treat your own children with respect and with dignity. We find amongst the list of 
the things that he, the messages that he shared with his people, he said at one time that this whole world and all the things that are in the world are blessings from Allah. Ad-dunya mata' wa khayru mata'iha al-mar'atu salihah the whole world, the whole universe, all the things that we enjoy, these are blessings from Allah. Blessings from the Almighty. And out of all these blessings that God has given to us, the best of those blessings is to have a pious woman, a decent woman, a female citizen in society who is caring and kind towards fellow beings. So again, more emphasis. And this gradual education of the people to say, look, you have to realize that the women that you have despised for so long are not actually what you regard them to be. They are a source of entry into heaven for yourself. They are a source of comfort and enjoyment and affection and all the things that you will desire as human beings. And in light of this, the, the verse of the Qur'an, in which the Qur'an says that addressing the men, the Qur'an says, <coughs> excuse me, the Qur'an says that the women are like a garment for you. And it addresses the women and says, the men like a, like, are like a garment for you. Hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahunna. Now let us see what this means. Just as you and I wear garments and clothes to protect ourselves from the elements, from the cold and the rain and the heat and the sun. Likewise, a man is a source of protection for the woman and the woman is a source of protection for the man. Just as you and I wear garments to adorn ourselves, to beautify ourselves, to make ourselves presentable in society, so is the case with the husband and the wife. They are there to complement one another, to strengthen each other, to give security, protection, adornment and beauty to one another. And that is the idea that Islam projects or promotes with regard to the position of women. And very interesting here, wherever the issue of women is discussed at least in so far as the uh, the things that are presented to you so far religion is not mentioned faith is not mentioned it is not just about Muslim women it is about women in general as an equal creation an equal partner to men in this creation of the human being side by side they come together, they complement one another to become a complete unit. If we look at other examples of how the messenger Muhammad peace be on him encouraged his people to respect the dignity and the honor of women. How he tried to raise position of women within society that this is what Islam has to say about women he said at one time Jannah heaven lies at the feet of your mother now think about this all those young men those young children who grew up with the teachings and the coachings of their father about the lowly position of women, they would certainly not have been able to respect their mothers. Because all they will have heard from their fathers is that women are dirt. They do not deserve any respect. They are not equal to us, etc., etc. And so no child, no offspring, no son or daughter would have been able to appreciate the value of a mother. So what does the messenger say? He says that heaven lies at the feet of your mother. What does this mean? 
It means if you serve your mother, if you respect her, give her love and affection, protection, and all the things that she will require. When you've done that, that will result in your entry into heaven. You see, each time the, the society, members of society are being encouraged to respect the status of the woman. And the ultimate prize is being promised, which is entry into heaven. You want to go to Jannah, you want to go to heaven. That's the prize that awaits you, the trophy that awaits you, if you take these things into account. At one time he was approached by one of his companions, Sahabi, radiallahu anhu, Allah be pleased with him, who asked him, O Messenger of Allah, who deserves my respect? Who deserves that I respect them more than anybody else? And Muhammad, peace be on him, said, Your mother. And he asked again, After my mother, who shall I respect more? And the messenger said, Your mother, second time. And the man said, Yes, after my mother, who shall I respect more? And for the third time, the messenger said, Your mother. So he asked again, after the third time, Yes, after I've respected my mother, who should I respect more? At that point, the messenger said, Your father. Clearly highlighting the position of the mother, the position of the woman within the family home, within the family structure. That yes, your father is very, very important, but your mother is three times more important. And that is not to say we respect father three, uh, three times less or mother three times more in, in comparison, no. But the three times mentioning of the mother is for added emphasis. That there are no two ways about it. The mother, the woman, has to be respected more than the father, the man. That's the, that's the lesson that I draw personally from this incident that a woman is being required to be respected three times more than the man. So these are the different ways in which the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be on him, tried to educate his people to show to them that women have to be respected and they have a special place in society. Of course we have the other angle to this where we talk of rights and equality and all that. I believe Islam has given men certain rights and Islam has given women certain rights and they are certain rights which are shared by both genders equally. But for Muslims and for Islam, when we talk about the rights of women and the rights of men, we talk about rights alongside responsibilities, roles and duties, roles and responsibilities that each has to play within, within society, within the family setup, and as individuals in wider society. So where we talk about men having certain rights, which apparently might mean or might show us that uh, the women's right in relation to that particular area have been ignored, you'll find when you look at the roles and responsibilities that go along with it, that indeed what Allah has ordained is the right thing uh, for all involved. But that is not to say that we, we stop there. If you look at the different laws of Sharia, for example, we have certain things that are cast in stone, to use a phrase, certain things that God has ordained and no, nothing can change that. And there are other areas of Sharia law, of Muslim law, where Sharia is progressing, is being reformed, and the rulings are being looked at every now and then. And that perhaps is one of the advantages that the different schools of thought within Muslim tradition afford and uh, offer. It's areas like the number of wives, 
that a Muslim man can marry, for example. If you go back into history, again going back to the uh, society within the Arabian Peninsula, before this ruling of the Quran with regard to the number of wives was introduced, people married unlimited number of women. There was no limit. Depending on your wealth and your position in society, you could have 10, 20, perhaps even 100 wives. There was no limit to it. And that was truly open to abuse. And I'm sure that such men abused their freedoms of having more than one wife. And there would have been countless women who would have suffered the consequences of this unrestricted allowance for marriage, an open license. And so when Islam came to this society, Islam tried to strike a balance. The teachings of the Messenger Muhammad were designed to be able to quite readily be accepted by the society. So you can well imagine if he just came from day one and said, right from this day on, you shall not marry except one woman. That would have been a very difficult thing for society to accept. And so you find that allowance of four, more or less, would have satisfied most of the society to say, okay, now we don't have an open license, but this is allowance for four. And then you go further than that, you go deeper than that, then the Quran says that two, three or four, it also quite clearly states that if you are unable to look after more than one wife, then you should have just one wife. So one could say, and I'm quite happy to say this, that this is the exception rather than the rule. Not every Muslim man has four wives. Indeed, I only know maybe three or four who have two wives. I don't know anyone who has three or who has four. Certainly in the society that we live in, the British Muslim society. It might be the case in certain other parts of the Muslim world. But the idea is, with regard to the uh, number of wives is not something that the man is uh, in any way demeaning the status of the women. If one were to look at it in the spirit of partnership, for example, then one, uh, one wife would appreciate and perhaps even welcome a second if they were to approach it in a partnership spirit. Of course, if they were going to be uh, rivals, then they would, there would definitely be friction in that. And that would go against the, the spirit of the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah. That is one, one area where uh, sometimes it is felt that uh, uh, Islam uh, deals a raw deal to, to women, and so the position of women uh, in Islam is not fully appreciated or not fully uh, looked after. But when we look at all the, the reasoning behind that and the uh, philosophy of this, then one can appreciate why Islam would have introduced such rulings. Indeed, the Messenger did not stop talking about the position of women in Islam and raising their status and elevating them to an equal footing with regard to respect uh, in relation to men even in his last days and uh, on his deathbed he reminded the people to be fearful of Allah and to establish prayer and he said be fearful of Allah in the treatment of women you must treat them well and he also reminded the men again with regard to the treatment of women and, and depending on how you look at it uh, you, might, you might perhaps come to a different conclusion but this is the conclusion that I have come to with regard to this tradition wherein the messenger said that uh, I'm going to just give you a gist of 
the tradition the message that he was trying to pass on was that women are sensitive people they need special care and special attention things that men might not regard as important could be very and extremely important to women somebody might say that are you inferring that women are less capable of being in control of their feelings and so forth but that's that's an angle that i would not approach this from i i want to establish from this statement that the messenger is going to great lengths in educating the men to say look they are very a very special type of creation of allah they need special care they need special attention and they need all your understanding because if you fail to negotiate with them and to work along with them bearing in mind their sensitivities then you will not be able to benefit as the quran proposes that you are garments for one another that situation will not arise but if you're able to be uh, sensitive towards their needs and their feelings and how they feel and how they work and how they how they think then you will be able to derive all the benefits as in being garments for one another of course he also introduced all the other uh, rules and regulations which were prevalent in in times before his message where women uh were forced into marrying whoever their parents wanted uh in whatever whatever conditions and so on and so forth uh, but i feel that uh, time has moved on now i should i should give you all i should i think i will i will give you all a chance to to comment uh and uh, perhaps uh, say a few words if you wish uh, uh, or even uh, ask questions and I'll, I'll do my best to to answer yeah jazakallah thank you for your patience sallallahu alaihi wa nabiyil karim wa sada wa alhamdulillah rabbil alamin of course points to me um I wanted to add a few points to that. Um just to say that you know people tend to degrade the status of women uh, especially in the society uh, the woman at home the woman at home especially in Islam is seen as somebody who's oppressed um and that to be honest couldn't be further from the truth um women in Islam uh basically I think in this society people devalue um the sort of the work that is done in the house so the, the woman who looks after her children who looks after the house uh and and basically looks after her husband and she'll be she'll be given the jannah but the thing is people don't look at um how valuable that job is um i mean the women are sort of seen uh as sort of backward and you know not not from this century if they don't sort of have a job um but subhanallah isn't this one of the most beautiful and most rewarding jobs that that a person uh, could do be them a man or a woman <coughs> uh, another point i wanted to make that um even then uh it's the case is that women don't have to do those jobs in the house they do have the right uh, i'm sure many men will know to to ask for a maid uh, to do their jobs for them uh, and it is obligatory on uh, for the man to to oblige to that fact um <coughs> and uh, also unlike uh, many other religions uh, or cultures women did not need to fight for their rights uh, right from the very beginning uh, pro- uh, Allah has given the rights to the women uh, right from the very start so there was no need for women to, to fight for the same kind of rights that women in the western uh, cultures or even other cultures had to fight for re- just literally recently in the 1960s and and so forth um and even sort of looking at the status of some of the most important women uh like the pro uh like the prophet's wives fun i mean some of the, like uh <coughs> the wife of the prophet uh Aisha radiyallahu anha who held such a high status 
uh, and was also teaching and she was an alima uh, and she was regarded in such a high status by all the Muslims. So I mean even looking at that um, we can just see how uh, how Islam holds women in such a high regard. Uh, and also I suppose you can look in even in terms of say marriage, uh, women would give, have been given many rights compared to uh, many other religions. I mean just say comparing to uh, to, to Hinduism, one of the one of the traditions in Hinduism, which is actually part of the Hindu uh, uh, religion, is that when the husband dies, uh, the woman should be burnt alive with uh, the husband. Um, even then, if she isn't burnt with the uh, with the husband, um, she's not allowed to show her face. Uh, she's not allowed to marry again. Whereas, if you look at the contrary in in Islam. Uh, women are uh, who, who who are divorcees or even widows um, basically can uh, are encouraged to marry. Otherwise, uh, basically the the society will become corrupt. Um, and also, contrary to sort of common practices and stuff uh, here in Leicester and probably all across the world, um, women at the time of the Prophet were allowed into the mosques and were able to pray and without any. Uh, if you sort of go around even here in Leicester to try and enter a mosque as a woman, uh, you'll probably be turned away because they will say there's, there is no space for you. But if you look at the time of the Prophet, the women were allowed to go in there and uh, perform their prayers. Nobody uh, would stop them. And subhanAllah, uh, personally, I don't think anybody has the right to tell uh, a woman to sort of uh, go away or to stop her from performing her prayers. Uh, I think, inshallah, if we've got any questions to be collected, we'll have a look at it. There's a question here about uh, whether is it whether it is necessary for a woman to convert to Islam for a Muslim to be able to marry her. Uh, Muslims are allowed to marry women from the people of the book, the Ahlul Kitab, the women who follow the true tradition and teachings of Musa or Moses. Alayhi salam, peace be on him. In other words, following the true uh, Judaic teachings brought by Musa alayhi salam, and a woman following the true teachings of Jesus, Isa, peace be on him. In other words, true Christian teachings as brought and taught by Jesus or Isa alayhi salam. Then they do not need to convert, they are allowed to continue practicing their true. Judaism or their true Christianity. Uh, women from any other faith tradition would not be allowable uh, in marriage for a Muslim man. The next question is um, just as women and education. I guess it's just uh, asking for a comment on what the position is with regard to women and education. Indeed, women have every right and equal right to obtain an education as the men. Uh, indeed, uh, we've, we've, we've just heard how um, the Prophet's wives and other women within the Prophet's community were very well versed with Islam, and indeed were the, were the professors, for lack of a better word, uh, from whom the traditions were received. Indeed, many of the traditions that I would have quoted to you today would have come through the line or the chain of transmission involving women. So yes, you have every right to gain an education. Of course, we have to bear in mind all the teachings uh, of Sharia. Uh, and as long as you bear them in mind and you adhere to those teachings, there is nothing stopping you from acquiring an education. I think just adding to that, um, the Prophet also said that uh, ilmi faridatun ala kulli muslim uh, that the, the the seeking of knowledge is a far uh, is obligatory for every for every Muslim, be them male or female. Uh, so for you not to to get an education, you're actually not doing a far. So you are, you are obliged to get an education. Uh, many men believe a woman should leave a job if they marry. Is this true or is it a big tale? <laughs> yeah, it looks like a very big tale. Um, 
in, in Muslim societies, uh, and I, 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 I don't, I'm not sure if I can generalize as such, but if there is such a thing as partial generalization, I could say, generally speaking, in Muslim societies, indeed in non-Western Muslim societies, the general trend is for the man to go and work. The man has a job and brings uh, home the money and puts food on the table. The woman usually is in charge of running the household, looking after the family and so forth. That of course is changing, not just uh, uh, in, uh, amongst the Muslim communities and societies in the western part of the world, but even in, in non-western parts of the world, this is a, a phenomenon that is, that is, that is ever-changing. Um, the way to approach this would be to discuss with the prospective husband or whoever is involved in this to see what the position will be with regard to the young uh, lady's job, whether she will be allowed to continue or not, etc. Uh, you might find that uh, uh, if the job is all about getting an income uh, and the husband is able to provide that and there is, it is felt that the wife the, the wife to be will no longer need to have a job for that added income, she could uh, give it up. But sometimes it's not always about income, it's about career, it's about service to humanity. Um, so if she's, a, if she's a nurse, a doctor, a teacher, um, something like that, and the husband who she's marrying is, is very well off and they don't really need a second income, that she might want to carry out and carry on her services of caring for society, caring for the community, uh, teaching, um, providing health care and so on and so forth. That has to be negotiated between the two parties. So long as, like I said, the basic requirements of Sharia are upheld and looked after, I don't see any problem or any reason why a woman should give up uh, a, a job which is benefiting the society in such a good way. Uh, it says here the messenger married 11 women. Can you give a reason why each of the women was married? We have uh, different reports. Uh, sometimes the number of 13 is quoted as well, sometimes the number of 9. Uh, time doesn't allow me to explain exactly why each woman was married, but there were several reasons. The most important thing to remember is that at the age of 25, when he married his first wife, Khadija, Allah be pleased with her, she was a widow of 40 years of age and she remained his only wife. He did not take on a second wife until after she died. Uh, they spent something like 25 happy years together. And it is only upon her death at the age of 50 and after that, uh, that he, he took on other wives. If you look at the list of the wives, you will find that apart from Aisha, Allah be pleased with her, his last wife, who was very young, all his other wives were either widows or divorcees. And the reason why he married a lot of these women, some he married because um, they, were, they were divorced, they needed someone to look after them, someone to look after their children, so he married them. To set an example for the society that, look, once a woman is divorced, she is not dirt, she is not filth, she is worthy of marriage, she is still a human being, she is still somebody who needs care and affection and love and security. And so I also marry a divorcee, what is so, what is so difficult? for you to marry a divorcee. That was one reason. He married widows. Again, to show the society that once a woman has lost her husband, it doesn't mean she's lost all her dignity. It's not no fault of her that she, her husband has died. She deserves a secure home, love and affection, and somebody to look after her. And so I marry divorcees. Why should you also not marry divorcees? So that was another way of raising the status of women within society, all the different women, divorcees, widows, and so on and so forth. Sometimes he married women from two different clans who, were, who have been fighting for centuries. For a long time, the two clans or the two tribes have got a long history of 
war and fighting. So he would deliberately marry one woman from this clan or tribe and another woman from this tribe or clan. So he becomes an in, a son-in-law of both the tribes. And whether they like it or not, those tribes then have to make peace because their daughter has been given to the messenger of God. So it, he used this as a reason for reconciling between two warring people where life was being lost, people were being killed. He managed to make peace between these two people by marrying women from the different. So these are some of the reasons why he would have married. Uh, as I said, Aisha, Anha, his last wife, was the only young uh, virgin wife that he married uh, at a very advanced stage in life. Uh, sometimes some people very wrongly uh, raise the issue about uh, being married to a multitude of women to fulfill one's manly desires. In the case of the messenger, peace be on him, that is totally rejected and untrue. Uh, as you can see, at the age of 50 is when he took his second wife. That's when your energies are now beginning to give up on you and your manly drives and everything more or less is slowing down and so forth. So that was not the reason, but there were social reasons, political reasons, and other reasons uh, to the... He was the best to his women and I'm the best to be good to you. Yes, that's right. That's right. He, he said, I'm the best to my wives, and you also have to treat your wives uh, with respect and dignity. There's one here that says, can you give the ruling and evidence on marriage when your parents do not want you to marry the wife of your choice, even if one is biased. Even if she is biased. You'll have to see me for this one. We'll do a one-to-one -one on this. What if you tell your wife to cover herself when going out in public and tell her to perform her salah but does not listen and what should be done? Well, you cannot force anything upon anyone. Uh, you can encourage them, you can remind them, you can lead by example, you can pray yourself and, uh, and pray to God that he guides your wife. Or it could be the other way around. Why should it, or why should it necessarily be the wife who's not praying? It could be the husband who's not praying. It could be the husband who's not uh, respectful in the way he dresses, dresses or in the way he goes about in society. It can work both ways. So there should be an understanding rather than being critical of one another, uh, one, sh one should be supportive to their spouse uh, to say, yes, there is a weakness, I'm here to help you, I'm here to support you, together we can do it. It should never come to become a conflict situation. Then things will take a turn for the worse. Sort of similar, similar lines. Yes, this is about a woman not treating her husband in a good manner and using, of course, uh, it's more often the other way around where the husband is mistreating the woman. That is totally wrong. There is no room for that in Islam. Uh, perhaps that is one of the reasons why talaq or divorce has been made permissible to allow such individuals who are going through miserable times in their life to get out of that misery. Um, I'll be happy to talk to um, these people with uh, specific queries whenever I'm, I'm around, inshallah. Uh, there's a question about the clothing of women, whether um, certain types of clothing is allowed or not. Uh, I think uh, just to give you some help with the Muslim idea of, I don't know if I can use the word philosophy, about covering up. Uh, different societies and different cultures have different ideas about private parts. Islam has its own idea about private parts. So for example, in, in Britain or in England, uh, society at large might regard the private parts of a man to be the most private parts. So if you were to go swimming, for example, you're expected to wear swimming trunks which will only cover your most private part. That is regarded as private part in Western society. If it's women, uh, you're going for a swim or something, you might wear a swimming suit or wear a bikini suit to cover your most private part. That is the idea of 
the private parts for a woman in Western society, in Western culture. But in Muslim societies, in Muslim culture, our idea of private parts is more than just that. So for the male, the private part extends from the navel to the knees. According to different schools, it's either just past the knees, or just above the knees, or just above the navel, or just below the navel. Nevertheless, it is that part of the body that needs to be covered. So all that would be regarded as a, as a, as a private part. So when I go swimming, I wear specially tailored, very long swimming trunks that will cover that. Because for me, it would be as wrong to expose my thigh as it would be to expose my most private part. That is the Muslim idea of private part for male. For female, the Muslim idea of private is not just her most private part, but her entire body, except the face, the hands, and the feet, is regarded as the private part. So it would be as wrong for a woman who is um, truly trying to practice the teachings of her faith to expose, say for example, her arm as it would be to expose her chest area or any other most private part. So this is the idea, this is the way Islam approaches the issue of private part. And hence, the rulings about garments and clothing would follow that thinking of Islam behind the private parts. And so when it comes to women wearing clothes, we say tight-fitting garments would not be advisable because they do not provide you the covering of your private as loose-fitting clothes, garments and boots. Of course, in the privacy of your home, with, you, with your own uh, family with whom marriage is not allowable, you are free to dress as is respect as much as is respectably acceptable. When you go out into wider society, advisable to put on something loose fitting so that uh, strange people uh, have have no view of your of what Islam regards as, as private. I hope that answers your question. Uh, this is another uh, another question about visiting the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's uh, um, resting place in Medina to Munawara, whether one should uh, cover one's face, i.e., wear the niqab or not. That would be uh, dependent on your practice. If you are, if you wear your niqab when while you're at home and in your own community, you can carry on to do that while you're there. If you don't and you feel that uh, you don't cover your face, then you can carry on with that practice. Again, you would have to consult your your imam or the if you're on the hajj, then the muallim would be able to give you guidance in uh, in relation to that specific question. Okay. Thank you for your questions. I'd like to say JazakAllah khair to, uh, to the Imam. Uh, inshallah, can the, the brothers make their way down to the, the prayer room? Inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll pray, inshallah, before we leave. JazakAllah uh, khair.